screen is very good, but the eyes not so. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure I would have to pull out my glasses. My real glasses. Oh, guys, we need more and more pairs. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Syria Security Seminar here at Purdue University. It is my great pleasure today to introduce Hal Aldrich from Cyprus and Electronics, and he's going to talk about not the who, but the what, new applications of hardware identity. All right. Thank you. So uh, happy to be here today at Purdue again. Uh, and as for those who aren't outside Purdue in uh, Indiana today, it's uh, 90 degrees and sunny, and we're all going to the beach afterwards. Um, so, uh, uh, so hopefully we'll have an inter interesting few minutes uh, for the uh, presentation today. The, uh, the topic today is, um, is a variation of a uh, topic that a lot of folks are seeing uh, in your um, uh, cybersecurity studies these days about identity. Um, you know, how you actually can use an identity to help in your protection profile of a system of proving, you know, that the users that you think are using your system are the ones who are using it, they're the authorized users, things like that. But I'm going to take it to a slightly different application today and start talking a little more about hardware identity and not necessarily focus on the, the people identity. And we'll talk about some new applications of things that can be done if you start looking at different ways to identify the actual hardware in your system. But let me uh, just start a little bit and talk about just identity in general, because a lot of the concepts I'm going to talk about are related to how, you, how the, the, um, the uh, analogies between a person's identity and a uh, hardware's identity. So, so why would you need to, uh, to, to prove your identity? Well, you do that on a regular basis. You're applying for a job. You have a bank transaction, something that uh, you want to make sure that only you can do or someone wants to get some information about you and wants to know that, that you are the person they're getting that information about. So a lot of different ways to do that. Now, the, the, the three main ways, at least talking from the, from the computer side of the world, are the something you know, something you have, and something you are. So the something you know is the, the, is the password. In, in the, you know, the non-computer life, that is your ID number. In the U.S., it could be your social security number, things like that. So that is something that's, that's related to you that you know. The something you have is a passport, driver's license, something like that. So it's a document or in, in the case of the computer cycle, a token or something that allows the computer to talk to another small device that says, yes, the person who has me is this person. Now, obviously, there's some implications there that that's not necessarily tied to you because it's just the token. It's assumed that you have the token. So there's some problems with that that you get into. But one of the, ways, one of the re ways folks are trying to get around that is looking at uh, something you are. That is the biometric. That is, you know, in real life, it's being able to look at you and recognize a face. In, uh, in uh, uh, computer life, it is, can I have a fingerprint for a scanner? Or the biggest database for biometrics are fingerprints right now, or iris or other things. So we can look at different variations of those together. Now, the key point in that, as you start thinking about it, as you start going to identity, for hardware is some of those are innate to you, like something like the, the something you are. DNA is another thing that can be used for an identity. So that's something that is specifically you that is very difficult for someone else to, uh, to, to take or move to another place. Or So it's something that is, is, is very definitely you. The flip side of that is it's also something that's called non-revocable. So it's something that if you lose your DNA code and say there was a way for someone to replicate DNA and fool a machine or something that was trying to identify you, there's no way for us to say, oh, sorry, uh, you need new DNA. But we can do that for a token or you can do that for a password. But there's also other things you get into about having to deal with the aftermath of that. And one of the things that we've been doing historically at Cyprus has been in uh, key management for encryption. And in that case, it has a has kind of a commonality with identity that those keys are the long uh, numeric strings that actually allow you to, to have two different entities or multiple entities to talk to each other uh, over an encrypted network. So what happens when somebody loses their key, loses their public key, which is not a big deal in, in PKI, but losing their private key is a big deal, or losing a symmetric key is a big deal. 
So being able to actually say, okay, fine, you lost your key, the world's not ending, the, the government does not have to shut down because you lost your key, we can work through it. So how you do that also has applicability to identity. So again, the, the example here is the, uh, the, the process of having a, 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 a person who wants to be identified, having a characteristic, and in this case I'm showing the fingerprint, and an authentication mechanism, which is also key to the process, that, that has the ability to take the data, however it's collected, either you know, be a scan or whatever, or a token, or again, however you're doing, you're getting that identity in, and the ability to authenticate it back to a database, authenticate it back to something that relates that piece of data to you. Similarly for a thing, it's a similar process. There has to be something in the thing, in this case there's a little airplane there showing, and you can think of maybe an electrical component or a computer or something in that, in that device, is how do we actually authenticate back that whatever we're checking on that device is something that is that device and it's current, it's who it's supposed to be on the network, and then you can go into the thought process of the, you know, similar to role-based access control and other things that say that, okay, once I've proven this person or this thing is what it is, here's what they are authorized to do. Here's the information they are authorized to get, and here's the information from them I will trust when I get it. Now, before I go into some of the, some of the, the other things and the details of hardware-based identity, let's talk about some of the, some of the more of the motivation of things and why you would want to have the identity of a piece of hardware versus the identity of a person. Um, one of the applications is uh, called supply chain risk management. It's, uh, sometimes it's called SCRM or SCRIM for short. The concept there is that I need to make sure that the part that is being put into my system is the part that I think it is. Now there's a whole industry out there, you know, similarly to, um, uh, to uh, cybercrime, that has to do with counterfeiting parts. Now, a lot of those are physical parts that folks are saying that this part is now, I've, I've either figured out a way to make the part or I've taken an older part that had expired or a part that wasn't rated at a certain level and now I'm going to, to change the markings or other things on the part to say that now I can sell it for a higher price. So that's a, an industry out there, again, it's a, a, a cybercrime related industry, but it's getting more, more like traditional cybercrime now that the actual data that could be on the chip where do I know that the data got on the chip? So if I have a, 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 a say, an ASIC or something, which is an application-specific integrated circuit, that I'm a, a vendor is actually burning the design into the, um, uh, into the chip, then how do I know that was, that was made correctly? Similarly to slides, how do you know that the, the word hardware was actually spelled correctly on the, the top of the slide? So that's another thing to be aware of when you're doing slides late at night. Always check your spelling. Um, so other applications for that are in a, a mobile space, and one of the new growing applications is bring your own device. The, um, the concept there is that you'll be able to bring your own device to work, your own cell phone, so forth, and you'll be able to use it for work purposes. So that may be fine for the, for the uh, uh, company that's allowing you to do that, but they want, may want to make sure that only Sue's mobile phone, that's the only phone that I'm going to allow her to use so because I know that it's been had some software or something loaded on there to protect its security. So how do I identify that phone? In the cloud, everybody's probably heard various speakers talking about cloud security. One of the issues there is obviously you're losing some control of where your data is and what's processed, but you may choose to say, hey, I only, this data needs to be processed anywhere in the U.S. I don't care where it's processed, but it has to be processed in the U.S. So how do I have some way to, to have uh, some guarantee that the identity of the computer that is, being pro that, is, that is processing my data is still resident in the U.S.? So that's an, that's an interesting part of identity. Uh, as we get into some of the critical infrastructure type applications, so that you actually have a computer that is controlling a generator, that is controlling a, a water treatment plant or anything like that, how do you know that the data that is being sent back from that device that you're doing maybe to make decisions on about how, how, how to configure a power grid or something like that is coming from the right place or the right device and not just someone else on your network that happens to be connecting. So those are some rationale between, behind hardware identity and why that's important. Now here is where kind of the, 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 the transition point for a lot of folks comes into of of what are the difficulties with hardware identity. Um, it sounds like on the surface it's actually easier to identify hardware that is a person 
because you know I have control of the hardware is built. I have the ability to assign a number or an ID number to the hardware. I have the ability to physically change the hardware to, to have some identity in it. Well, the problem is that that starts to break down a little bit, especially in more modern programmable devices. Um, traditionally, going back to that counterfeit type of application where folks are actually trying to inspect the chip and actually have somebody look at the chip, be x-ray or whatever, to make sure that device is what it is when it entered the, entered the manufacturing process, then there's actually a whole other science in how you do that and how you, how you either figure out if the chip has been if the, those parameters on the chip that have been burned into the chip are, have been modified or not. So we're sliding over to that and start talking about some of the, again, the easy ways. Like I'm going to have a, uh, in a piece of software, everybody has done the, um, uh, you know, installed a certain vendor software and they'll ask for a code or something to say, that is, this soft, is this software authorized for the computer or something like that. So all of that's easy to put into those pieces of software code and so forth. But then the question is, is how hard is that to change if I'm someone who wants to, to, uh, to, uh, to fake that? A um, couple of cases here where we talk about an ID number or a secret. An ID number kind of talking about here is that there is something that is not necessarily um, uh, something that is protected, it's just something that you know. So I can always key in my social security number, or my employee number, or my student number or something that's known. So, uh, although it's not widely known, I'm not putting it on my, hopefully, my, my Facebook page or something like that. But it is something that is, you have to recover if it's lost, especially if someone is doing it for identity theft or things like that. Similarly, on a, on a computer part, if I program the ID number into some volatile memory on the part, or non-volatile memory that has the ability to be altered, then someone who can get into the part can alter that number. Similarly, for a secret, here is just a little bit slightly more complex. So I'm actually taking some pains to keep that identity number a secret or that key a secret or that, that, that piece of information a secret that identifies the part. And I have a process that says when I need to have access to that, I go through some cryptographic mechanism or others to make sure that um, that, uh, uh, that that number is not sent out in a way that uh, is easy to, um, uh, to, to uh, find it out. So still, it's revocable, so something that I can still, if there's a problem, I can fix it if somebody loses it. But again, I can actually have somebody change it. Now, it's a little harder probably because they have to know some other information about the system. But the flip side of that is also, if I do lose it, then there's some implications to the rest of my security system. So let's say that I'm encrypting all the, the, um, the ID numbers for all my parts with one key. And that key is common to all my parts, and I have millions of parts out there. Not saying that's the best thing in the world, but there are documented examples of that's exactly what was done. So that has some implications there too. So the, what we're kind of sliding to now is, is the, the, what is the role of identity and integrity? So some of the things I've talked about earlier about ability to change a program that is in a device, that goes to the integrity of the device. How sure am I that any code that's in the device or the device itself is what I think it is? So if I can't be sure of that, then that has a tie back to the identity of the device. So if I can't ensure the, the integrity of the device, how do I ensure the identity of the device? But also the flip side is that too, is, is if I do have some question about the integrity, is there still some way that I can, I can have a good feeling about the identity of the device? So I may question the integrity, at least as it's coming into a process, but then is there some way I can say there is something of the identity of the part that is, that is something that is, is still something that can be protected by the, uh, the physical features of the device itself, whereas the integrity of the device may be compromised as, as, as a whole. So I can't guarantee the device is 100% there, but I can guarantee this was at least the part that I was thinking about. And what are the applications of that? And then how could I use that data to try to recover or confirm my identity, my, excuse me, my integrity, if I can assure that I knew what the part was to start from? So that's kind of the, 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 the where we're going for the rest of the presentation. And we'll talk about some technologies to do that and also a couple of applications we have of that. One is actually uh, a, 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 a joint program that we have with Purdue for the Department of Energy that talks a little bit about one of the applications of using that ability to identify the device. So one of the uh, technologies that we're, we're using for that is something called physically unclonable functions. Now, the concept there is we're actually going to use something that's more like the finger, like your fingerprint, 
but it's actually something that is in the, the physical part of the device. So like um, the DNA that created you, that creates you a little bit differently from everybody else, that also creates your fingerprints a little bit differently from everybody else, it's still the same basic mechanism. So you know, the, 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 the theory or the, the, um, the biology behind DNA doesn't vary from person to person. It's how that DNA sequence actually creates you or creates your fingerprint and so forth. So there's a similar thing that we're talking about for physically unclonable functions in that now we're saying is there a, a, a circuit or something that we could put on a part, in this case being a, an ASIC or an FPGA, a field program, an FPGA is a field programmable gate array. In that case, that is basically an a, a integrated circuit that you can program differently so it's, it can be updated and changed over the life of the part. Can we take the same logic that we're putting into that and can we guarantee that this, this, um, this logic will behave differently or give us a different response for each individual part that we put out there. So we're not modifying the part. We're actually just saying we're going to put the same program or the same logic in all the parts, but now we're expecting a different output from the part. So the, one of the ways that it's done here is this shows a couple of examples here of a, what's called a challenge response pair. The idea being there that you, you send a challenge of sequence of numbers to the, uh, to the device that has the puff in it, and then the puff will give you a different response to that set of numbers depending on which device you're talking to. So in this case, we show the same challenge, two different devices with two different responses. Now, one of the interesting things about this is it's not a, a simple, I have one challenge and one response. Since this is basically, fundamentally, when these things get down to it, they're, they're, they're uh, a circuit that is exploiting an analog characteristic of the part. So it's something that varies from implementation to implementation. And as we all know, the, the world is really analog, and we're just living in the digital part of it. Um, so there is actually a large number of challenges that you get in the ability to do that for a single part. So there's a large uh, ability to do different things with it and use it for different applications and use it over time differently, give folks different authorizations to interrogate the part. So you start thinking about now, is it just, uh, you're kind of changing the concept, again, going back to the, to the human biometric analogy of saying, okay, now I'm, instead of being worried about the fingerprint as a whole, I'm worried about the different ridges and the different ridge characteristics that I can have because now I can actually have multiple things I can look at, not just the pass-fail for one thing. Now, the key here that makes this interesting is it goes back to the concept that I talked about earlier with the three types of identity, the, the what you know, the, the, the what you have, and the what you are. So again, going back to that analogy here, this is a what you are in the case of a thing here. So it's what it is, if you want to change the, the, the grammar correctly. So this is something that isn't changeable for this variation. It's something that is you can characterize at, at different points in the process, and you should always get the same response to the same circuit. So that's where this is a, uh, has some, some of that same type of identity design, you could, as you would do with a person. You can still have other things in it. You can still have a secret that is burned into the device or a secret you store in the device. It's independent of this and still have more, multiple factors to look at. So a lot of the same analogies take place. But one of the keys is this is a fairly new phenomenon that we've been able to take advantage of. Uh, recently, um, as far as you guys can certainly look at the, the literature, um, that this has not been known to have the stability and so forth that we now know that it does have. So this is a new way to do it and it's being taken advantage of by uh, some folks now. Um, that goes back to the, the stable and reducible outcomes blurb on the, on the chart. Um, so basically the, the, the main takeaway here is there are other ways to do this, but thinking about how you identify a part or identify a piece of hardware, it's useful to have a, 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 a part of that three-factor identity that is related to something that is innate to the part itself. And it has the same, again, the same advantages and disadvantages to some extent as, as a human biometric. So switching a little bit now and let's talking about integrity. You, uh, before I digressed a little bit talking about puffs, I was talking about the concept of identity and integrity. So and also one of the, the applications that I talked about at the beginning about hardware identity goes to um, supply chain. Now supply chain is a, a word that has a lot of meaning to a lot of folks. The concept is that uh, all the parts that go into your computer, to your car, to an airplane, come from, come from many different places in many different countries, built by many different companies, 
and it's as you get to complexity a lot of times you know you you're just happy that the, the 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 plane took off with the amount of safety you needed to feel that you could get back on the ground now you're actually putting says you have a concern that now I'm not just worried about that I'm worried about well is somebody actually putting code into my plane? We've talked about, you can talk about that from just the, the, the normal cyber security type stuff. But here the, the, the physical thing is that instead of having to wait for someone to actually have access to load a computer code or to load a, uh, with a test apparatus or the different ways that you can talk about breaking into a, a system, here the, the break-in was basically built into the system. So this is that you could actually have a part in the system in such a way that could actually have a certain effect at a certain time because they know that the part was going to go into these types of systems. That's one thing that you guys have seen in other cybersecurity applications, the folks that are working against you are becoming much more targeted on their attacks such that in such a way that you know, you're not just saying that I'm going to sit malware out in the world. I may sit it out in the world, but I may sit it out in the world in such a way that it really will only work on certain folks' equipment. So similarly, for the, the hardware piece of this, I may be building, if I am a, 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 um, an entity that has some, has, wants an effect to happen, I may know that only 1% of this park actually goes into systems I'm concerned about affecting. But I can build the same problem into all my parts, and I'll get the effect, because eventually my parts will get to that 1%, and then I can do things about it. And this also is during the li is, has different characteristics throughout the lifetime of the part. So it can be something not at manufacturing time. It can be something that whenever it's, this part is outside of your control, that you're, you've left the part from some entity that you trust, be it the, the, um, uh, you know, the part that, the, say, the computer comes into the IT organization in your, at Purdue. At that point, it's trusted, although I saw a, a blurb on the one exponent or something going here, folks hacking signs outside of Stewart Center, so I'm not sure exactly. How, how stable that is, sorry, uh, uh, Purdue IT, I can make that joke about anybody's IT department. Um, so, you know, but they come into a point that it's trusted. So at that point, you say, okay, now I don't know what's happened to this since maybe the point of manufacture, but now it's trusted. So how do I verify that now that I, the characteristics of the parts are there, that the parts that I, I ordered are the parts that are actually in the system? Um, there are ways to actually build a lot of that into the parts so that they can protect themselves. Um, there's a whole science of uh, anti-tamper, and if you go into the, the different FIPS standards, say for cryptography, if you get to the higher levels of the FIPS standards in the process, they require some level of anti-tamper so that things like you know keys can't be corrupted, things like can be protected in the, in the cryptography world for those parts. Similar things for protecting the parts themselves. So that, that is a whole different area that has applications here, but it, it can get quite expensive depending on how paranoid you are. I mean, there are some very advanced techniques out there that are very good, but they're very expensive. Um, so how do I get away from doing that? So I don't want to commit to that. I just want to make sure that my identity is in the part, and then, and then again, talk back to the integrity of the part. Um, so then the question becomes is now I've got parts that are exiting and entering my supply chain at various points. So what are ways that I can actually make sure that I can verify integrity and identity at different points in the system? And then that goes back to that whole problem that we talked about at the beginning of it's not just knowing that the, the identity is there that's in the part or in the person, it is the authentication system. Where's the data available at the right places so the folks that need it can have enough data to authenticate the part, but maybe not all the data that's possible on that part because if that one subset, say that one group that was trusted now becomes untrusted for whatever reason, they've had a, an, an insider attack or they've lost their data or for whatever reason, um, now how do I actually say, okay, the rest of the data that's for this part is in a safe place somewhere that I can now redistribute that, and that goes to the recovery that we talked about earlier. So let's talk about building the hardware ID in through a trusted process. So the, the concept here is that, is that there's different places in the process that I can start looking at ID. And I can also, again, going back to the concept of understanding the hardware ID, knowing the part, then I could also now think of other things that I could have built into that part that's unique to that part that knowing the identity I can confirm. So, you know, without getting too off topic here, you know, if you could start thinking of things like um, the puff itself, for example, 
is a circuit in the part. So that I could actually, if I altered that area of the part, then I can actually change the, the, the effect of that puff. So if I'm going to now, it's kind of like the, uh, the similar effects you start getting of thinking of that. I have an encryption algorithm, and I've made some minor changes to the key. I get, will not necessarily get the expected results, or I may get the results that are so bad that I know that something has happened to this because I know that there's not a simple error or something that could have happened to cause this output. So there's a whole thought process there about integrity that goes into chip design and some other things that I'd be happy to talk to folks about. But, um, but the idea here is that once I get to that point of having the, the, the ID, and again going to an example that I mentioned earlier, like the puff, like something that is inherent to the part or with a security, the same type of thinking about the different types of identity and rolling that to a security posture that will allow you to have confidence in the ID, then you can start at different places in the cycle and start looking at verifying that. So it's not just I'm relying on having a trusted manufacturer. So if you look at, um, there is a um, trusted foundry in the U.S. that's managed by IBM that a lot of folks use if they want to make sure that they want a part that is built exactly the same way in a high security facility so they're sure that part comes out this way. But I may not want to do that because that's expensive, has a lot of lead time. Historically, their parts aren't necessarily the, the highest uh, technology parts because they're usually a little bit behind in their ability to, to keep up. So I'm going to choose to say now I'm going to have a, I'm going to have a device built in a different way. So I may register the, I may choose to register the device after I get it or after I get the part and I'm going to put it into a circuit board or after I get the circuit board I'm going to put it into a, a, a computer device or something like that. So if I can't, I, if I don't trust the manufacturer and I can't have them collect the data or insert the data or something like that into my part when they're building it, so now I have to think about, okay, now I'm now going to try to verify that after the fact. So this goes to some of the uh, conglomeration of some of the techniques that we've been talking about. So if I know that this is what's supposed to be there and I have the ability to, to understand what those things should be answering to me on a certain characteristic versus another characteristic because, again, I knew the characteristics of the puff, what they should have been, or even at that point I'm saying that I have a device like an FPGA that is a raw device. So now there's actually nothing programmed in there, but what I want to do is I want to now start programming it. So there's some basic tests I can do a little bit simpler to verify the bare part itself was okay. But at that point forward, I want to make sure that this code that's, that is loaded onto that, that device is good from there forward. So that's part of enrolling it and verifying it during manufacturing integration. So you have some choices there you could make. But say that even after I've, I've done the verification during that point, and it still leaves my supply chain. So something as simple as I programmed all the parts and I'm putting them to a FedEx envelope and I'm shipping them across the country to, to another place. You know, although you know, there's a lot of security that FedEx and, and the other shippers do, there are still the same type of attacks that, we, that, you're, that everybody's susceptible to in man in the middle and other type of attacks. So depending on how paranoid you are, you might want to check it again when it got to your depot or wherever that, that point in the process is. Now the problem with doing that is now you're starting to separate that data as I mentioned earlier. So you're not going to want to put all the possible data. So the example could be the challenge response pairs or the different, um, uh, the different passwords that are, excuse me, the different IDs that are stored on the part. Or in a case maybe you have five secrets stored on the part you're only going to give the verification folks one. And then you'll have four in reserve because that goes to the revocability. And maybe later on when I lose control of the part or the part is in a system, I can't go and actually change that part anymore. Um, so how do you actually distribute that becomes one of those interesting issues of availability versus the other security characteristics. So how do you make sure that I have enough data at the point that I want to do the verification when I need it to do the verification versus having the high security that I'm really going to never going to distribute the data. So that's where some of, the, some, of the, some of the concepts of the key management and other things that are the more classic parts of, of encryption and, and cybersecurity backbones can actually be used for identity. Just another view of that, kind of showing the process a little bit differently here. The idea being that you would go from manufacture to integration. 
and then um, there would be something like we're calling it here the limited verification info, which might be that subset of info, not the complete device info for that subset. So the the part the the struggle here doesn't necessarily become integrating the identity in the part. It's actually dealing with all the information that comes from the identity of the part. So again, going back to the human analog of um, DNA. There's a reason that DNA isn't being used a lot for identity right now because of the complexity of it. But there's a wealth of information there. So it's simpler to go to other characteristics. Um, there's other reasons too for cost of sequencing and things like that. But, but it's a similar example. You can spend as much money to put as much data in the part as you want for security and get uh, as much testing and so forth in the beginning, but now you're just dealing with more data. So how you actually deal with that, and a lot of the issue, again, is actually the recovery. So what happens if you lose your data? I mean, going back to some of the, some of the attacks on, on RSA and other folks, you know, there was a, a, a loss of a small amount of data can cause a problem with a large amount of data. So there is a, that's the same problem here. So switching gears a little bit, let's talk about, we talked about the supply chain part, but let's also talk about something you can do for hardware identity for another application. Uh, the application here is actually a little more uh, in the, um, the key management area. So we have a, a joint task uh, that's funded by the Department of Energy here at Purdue uh, that has to do with smart grid security. Uh, the PIs here are uh, Professor Bertino in CS and Professor Kulatunga in uh, uh, electrical computer technology. Um, the idea here is that in, in a lot of applications, they're going to be ruling out a, rolling out a, a new power infrastructure so that the um, that power infrastructure would be in the U.S. it's called smart grid, it's called that in, in other, similar in other places too. The, um, the idea is that we can have a, a more uh, robust grid for distributing electricity, we can have a more efficient grid, we can also have a, a grid that is more energy efficient and so forth. So a lot of the way they're doing that is putting a lot more computing into the grid than they have in the past. The, the, the grids now are, are, in a large case, there are a lot of analog components. A lot of those components have been over there for quite a while. Uh, one of those components that's been there for quite a while is the, the meters that are on the side of houses, the side of buildings, and so forth. So the concept here is that they're going to be putting new smart meters on those buildings. And then the question is, well, you've got another computer out there that's collecting data. Some of that data is actually personally identifying, if it's for a home, about what could be going on in the home. You know, there's things you can look at if you had access to the data that could say, oh, well, they're probably cooking right now because we're getting a large draw on the, the circuit that, or the, the 220 volt uh, power supply for the area. So things like that. Also, there's uh, different other attack vectors. But the idea here is that how can I use those, that puff device to be able to actually be part of the key management system there? So can I use it to relate to the key that is actually used to protect or encrypt the data that is being transitioned back and forth to the power company. So part of the work here has been uh, on actually adapting some of, the, um, uh, some of the smart meters that are out there today and actually inserting the puff into the, uh, the keying process. Now the, the keys on these devices are, um, are, are stored, there's usually multiple levels of keys, so there's several keys within a uh, specific meter. Um, here, there's the, the advantage here of, again, if I remember earlier with the puff concept, that you can have multiple challenge response pairs to create keys, and then you can use those multiple challenge response pairs to actually update keys, change keys over time, so you're not thinking about a, 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 a situation where you've got millions of these smart meters, and literally that's where they're talking about millions, if you think of the number of houses and the number of applications in just the U.S. that would have these meters. The key management problem of dealing with all those pre-placed keys or those keys that are stored can become painful over time. So here the concept is that we can actually take the puff and be that, that thing that was built into the device that has the ability to change keys with a lot of, of changes, challenge responses, which again some of the technologies I'll talk to in another slide later on is a way to translate that to a key for an encryption key that can be built in long time. Uh, and you also have the added benefit earlier of being able to identify the part because it's not just the, the, the key number that was loaded into any arbitrary part. I'm looking at a characteristic of that part that I know what the next key in this case should be from that part. So that where I'm tying a little bit the identity directly to the cryptography. So that has some interesting characteristics to it. 
But this shows some of the some of the implementation that was done here with the uh, the the way that the 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 uh, initial designs were done with a puff being in a PC connected through the optical port, which in the meters we were using was the way that the keys could be updated. A couple of different the anatomies of the meters with the metering board, which is actually the board that actually does the sensing for the power that actually going into the house, and the communications board, which is actually taking that data and transmitting it back to the utility, and then the block there for the utility. So the 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 technology that uh, Purdue developed here was the concept of the the puff read once key, which is the puff rocks concept. Now. There's some good papers on that that I would encourage you to, to go out and look at that have been published. Uh, but the concept here goes back to the concept in cryptography of the, of the read once key. So that if there was a way in perfect cryptography that you had the ability to only use a key once or to have that key so that it's not necessarily easily derived what the other keys in the sequence would be or the other things in the sequence, you'd have a lot more security. And folks strive to have that. But, you know, there's a lot of compromises that are made, and sometimes you get away from that a little bit. But here is trying to use the puff to go back to that concept a little more strongly. Um, there's some unique uh, attacks here, which, is, which are the, uh, uh, this, uh, this application has the ability to, to provide a lot of um, uh, resilience against from fault, in, fault injection attacks. Also, the freezing attack here that's, that's uh, discussed. So, again, concept there is that um, uh, this is where that you get more than one application by having that hardware identity in the device. Um, and uh, this is one of them. The other things you can think of, again, are, are really a lot of the same analogs that you're talking about when you talk about to a person's identity. So, you, know, you get a lot of bang for the buck in that for dealing with the hardware part. So, um, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, um, the, uh, uh, and you're uh, interested in, in working or finding out more about Cypress, we've just opened a, an office here locally so that uh, we're actually hiring locally. And uh, if you have any questions or anything, I'm happy to take those now. And if you want to talk after the, the um, seminar is over about uh, employment possibilities, things like that, I'll be here too. For the read once keys, um, I assume the device would have to be designed to be disposable or we would want some way for the destruction of the original key maybe to be uh, predictable, but that would also be a problem for security. So what kind of applications do you think um, a read once key could be used for? Well, the, the, uh, you have a good point about being able to uh, make sure that the keys that were actually destroyed but it also separates the, product, the, the problem a little bit from the different, different things you worry about in security. If there is something that I am less concerned about, maybe the device, maybe that key is somewhere in the device, but I can assign my system in such a way that I can never get access to it again, then I may be able to have an attack on that device itself. Someone gets the device, tears it off the wall, and does something to it, versus being able to connect it to the network. So the, the implementations that folks have been doing about uh, uh, working at, we have the advantage of having one of the authors of the paper in the audience, too, that can answer the question. But uh, the concept really is that the, um, that the uh, computing is done in a separate device, similar to the way you would do it for to have a secure processor, secure coprocessor. But the way it's done is actually sequences through the, um, uh, using a, a existing key with the next puff say, challenge response pair to generate the next key so that the, the processor itself doesn't have all the information and that processor is segregated from the main processor on the system. So it's not quite perfect. There are still some attacks that work there, but it's, it's a, a security architecture decision that we believe has a lot of promise. Okay. Anything else? Question. Uh, yeah, well, thank you for the very nice, really talk. Uh, so, because I understand the supply chain problem is really a serious mm -hmm. problem. Now, in terms of PAF, uh, um, are they very expensive, uh, this type of devices, in your experience? Or, you know, could be a day that they can really be widely used for? Uh, they can, yeah. they definitely have some price advantages. That's one of the reasons that we looked at them for the, uh, for the Department of Energy project. Um, they have the choice of being something that you can either put into a to a a, a, um, uh, a integrated circuit that can be built in very large quantities, so it's not really a tax on that circuit once you've decided you're going to have a circuit. 
Um, if you're going to do it in a reprogrammable or in a uh, FPGA or in an application specific circuit, the actual the overhead to do that after you've already committed to says I need to do this for other reasons is very low. So it's not like you're committing to necessarily having a secure device somewhere else in the system that all it is doing is security. I and my students are collaborating a lot with service. We really enjoy working with them. So, as Dr. Aldridge said, you know, there uh, they have an office, a research lab. So, you know, <laughs> if you have any interest, they have a lot of uh, very fascinating projects. You know, please apply. <laughs> we, we really hope that they'll get a very strong researchers because this will be a benefit also for all of us here. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you.